the panel is open for discussion. First, Professor Majanovic. Yeah. Thank you for the great talks to all the speakers. Uh, I have a question for Professor Jalakovic. Um, do you suggest that uh, zof zofenopril should be then AC inhibitor of choice? Because as far as I know, it is not that much prescribed in Croatia. Well, yes, it is not so much prescribed, not only in Croatia, but worldwide. <laughs> and the fact is, this is not the drug which was produced in the States. So it's not so much uh, known other. It's produced in uh, Germany and Italy. Uh, the, your question is whether this should be the drug of choice. Well, maybe, but after we have enough evidence-based data. We have much more data with some other ACE inhibitors, which are used in large studies. So we, if we are looking at the data, if evidence-based, then we have to be strict there. But if we are thinking and knowing mechanisms of drugs, then we have to use often April much more than we use now. Thank you. Yeah, also to Professor Jelakovic, thank you very much. I think the H2S story is very interesting. But there is a strong link to nutrition, and that was published by Mitchell in Cell, I think a, a year ago. And this is the methionine pathway. So sister scion beta synthase, major enzyme generating H2S, and I think it's a pacemaking enzyme. And he showed that low methionine nutrition prolonged life of mice and flies and worms didn't show humans though, <laughs> and if they take out methionine. And so methionine is very low in, in plant um, uh, protein, and that might be one of the advantages. Um, there is contradictory data, and actually if you eat a lot of methionine, levels do not go up, but the link to homocysteine is clear. So there are a few questions, I think. One is, how can you measure H2S in humans? Are there any reliable data, as far as I have found so far, it's difficult to assess. And um, the second thing would be, uh, well, is there any evidence that, that the plant protein diets act in this pathway? No, the, the one of them, of the NIH grant I showed is this one, how to measure reliable uh, H2S in the human. Uh, this is so far the answer now. Also to you. Professor Jalakovic, um, I was just wondering about, so you mentioned H2S production in the colon, and I uh, wondered if the role of fiber might be increasing that production, perhaps, and how important that is. Could you repeat? I, I... Um, you, pr you mentioned about H2S production in, from colonic fermentation, and of course that would be increased by fiber, dietary fiber. So I wondered how important is that in this in its role in the body? Well, in the whole story. It is also the, the one of the topics that should be investigated much more. You know? But this is a uh, hypothesis with a good background. Professor Uxon and Professor Bozhikov afterwards. First, Professor Mirenko. How is the process to diminish uh, salts, not in nutrition in Croatia, maybe compared to with the Thank you very much. This is a very important uh, question and a very important topic. And this is, in fact, the most important mean how we can decrease hypertension and decrease cardiovascular risk to decrease salt intake. Well, it's a worldwide problem and we have, mm, mm, we have some good results that are obtained in Croatia in the last 10 years. In fact, we uh, achieved uh, with negotiation with food industry, because the salt is mostly coming from the uh, processed food, uh, with food industry, with bakers, and then with meat industry to decrease salt intake. And now in Croatia, by the law, the bakery is obligated to decrease salt to be no more than 1.4%, and it will be decreased in the further four years to the less. And then um, some of colleagues from Croatia uh, are aware and are very well informed that the biggest meat industry in Croatia decreases salt content by 25% in all products. And now the other one company, it's Podravka, will also decrease salt in all products. So we are moving on and I hope that we will uh, be on the way uh, where Finland and Great Brittany are now.
in maybe 10 or 15 years. Of course, with this long term, it is no uh, something that could be done and achieved in two, four or five years. We have one question over there, Professor Malenko. So sorry, it's my question is for the third presenter. It's so impressive that, that uh, you're regarding diabetes prevention in Finland. It's not the first one. And I'm really interested uh, about your, uh, what will be the, your recommendations for the practical implementation and do you have any result? Is there any, any effect of all this, I mean in general population in the matter of prevention of type 2 diabetes in your country? Uh, could you please repeat uh, some uh, kind of recommendations? What will be your suggestions to your government how to implement these that you find out uh, in your research? Uh, this is a very important question, and we have, this is the reason that in Stop Diabetes Study we have this societal level uh, work package. And um, um, at the moment we don't have results of these uh, societal actions and we don't have answers how to implement these strategies. But hopefully uh, we are getting for... Um, in this societal level work, work package, they are, for example, doing some kind of um, uh, interviews in different levels and uh, trying to get information how to implement these strategies. But thank you for the question. Thank you. May I just yes. find the, the uh, efficient, efficiently enough the, the uh, people uh, at risk. So this is one big aim of, of this stop, uh, uh, stop diabetes. Ursula, well. you are very lucky in Finland in that case. <laughs> there is a question, Professor Wuxon, and after that, Professor Pfeiffer. We have great three talks, uh, two made in Croatia and one import from Finland. Uh, I have a question for each of them, but I can start alphabetically, and if I last, I can ask more. So I think Professor Ilakovic won a wonderful talk, and uh, uh, I, I benefit a lot because I'm one of 45% of North American with high blood pressure after the study, and I take AC inhibitor, and I'm not sure I have to talk more with you later on. Um, your polypill, pill, uh, polypill, uh, and, and other comments is, is, is great, looks like blood pressure is reduced. But my concern that these are garlic based. And I wouldn't worry much about kisses. I wish I had a few more because when you have blood pressure, you're old, nobody wants to kiss you. But it reduces the stress. So when you reduce the stress, eliminate one of the factors that you say is important in, in blood pressure. But I, I I don't know whether I have questions, but I learned a lot from you. So I just, I, I designed uh, people behind me, behind me, they don't study much blood pressure. They, they study other fancy risk factors. We are, we are kind of strange group. We study also hypertension, and you and I discuss a lot about nitrate and all that. I designed actually a, a, a formula with no garlic. I'm sorry, I didn't put garlic yet. Uh, but, but reading your slides, what do you think if one combine arginine, amino acid, then if you like, we'll give you nitrate-rich vegetable. Uh, obviously, it will be all in background of uh, DASH diet. Potassium, low sodium, DASH. Uh, we study ginseng, it affects nitric oxide. Dario also studied ginseng, he knows what that. He found actually very nice reduction in blood pressure. You remember it in a couple of studies. and and. Uh, I don't know, parsley, I thought that parsley will be diuretic, you know, t parsley tea, and Tom Wulver fiber for microbiota. I think there will be miraculous things and could compete very well with some of medication because they have opposite but complementary action and no garlic smell. You think you yeah, could do something? It will be good, nice, and yeah. one separate arm might be double blind kissing. I would be one of the volunteers to receive, receiver. Um, this is for Dr. Maniku. I think. Um, the, one of the things we came across, and Stefan Kabisch um, presented those data, 
is that people have strong beliefs at the individual level about what is healthy and what is not. And so it looks like addressing those may be a promising approach. I wonder, do you, do you somehow have that in your plan or what is your opinion about that? Uh, that's true that opinions, of course, um, have an effect on that, what kind of uh, lifestyle people are uh, adhering to. In this Stop Diabetes project, if we think these individual level actions in, and we have this digital application, and this face-to-face -face group counseling, which we are aiming, um, heading to, trying to help individuals to follow the healthy lifestyle. Uh, there are strong evidence-based uh, these um, behavior change techniques used, and we have this um, self-determination theory uh, uh, as a strong basis, meaning that individuals can um, um, they, they can select themselves what to eat and how to do the physical activity. For example, if you want to increase the consumption of vegetables, there are several different ways to get there to eat enough vegetables. And uh, so I don't know if I answered your questions, but uh, yeah. Professor Oliver. Thank you also for you, Dr. Manico. You, you talk, your follow-up period that you showed was one year, and I wondered, are you going to, that doesn't seem very long for, are you doing a longer follow-up? Uh, yes, actually we are. The intervention period is one year, and after that uh, we have plans to continue as a follow-up. And we have asked permission to get, for example, registration data, and... Uh, Will, will, the, will the higher level, the societal level kind of interventions continue for longer? Um, actually, we'll see. Um, <laughs> hopefully, yeah. I have a question for uh, our first speaker. Uh, how do you look on obesity uh, from gastroenterologist perspective? <laughs> uh, Currently, we have, we have uh, a lot of diseases in, in, in the field of gastroenterology that are uh, connected, uh, connected with obesity, uh, especially uh, at the moment we are talking a lot about liver diseases where, where uh, NAFL, FLD and, uh, and uh, NA, uh, NASH or uh, non-alcoholic uh, statohepatitis uh, uh, have a perspective that will be maybe in uh, 10 to 20 years uh, uh, first cause of liver transplantation. So it is uh, it is a big change because uh, at the, at the moment we uh, we have a, uh, a lowering rate. Uh, we are lowering the rate of hepatitis B, hepatitis uh, hepatitis C because we have uh, prevention. We have drugs. So uh, we really uh, uh, really really the, the the fatty liver is uh, in in the first plan. But also many many other diseases are are connected with uh, with uh, with obesity. Like for example, uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease that is mostly connected uh, connected with this. And also I have spoken about uh, about the cancers. Uh, uh, almost all cancers in a, in a, in a, in a, the digestive uh, tract are, are, are connected uh, with a uh, higher relative risk uh, comparing to, to, to normal population. So really is an important topic in gastroenterology. Thank you. Professor Pfeiffer has a question. Uh, regarding NASH and fatty liver disease, the, the numbers which are published by gastroenterologists are relatively high for the risk of progressing to cirrhosis and finally to hepatocellular carcinoma. In diabetes, we see the majority of patients with significant fatty liver disease, but uh, having worked in the Department of Hepatology before, uh, I do not see virtually any patients with liver cirrhosis. And I have quite a number of patients whom I know for more than 20 years who had some sort of gallbladder or so operation, I always ask for a liver biopsy. They had NASH, so they had the inflammatory type of, fib even with some fibrosis of the liver, and they do not progress. They do even regress if you, if you go for the transaminases. So I'm quite skeptical about those numbers. What do you think, how reliable are they regarding the development of progressive liver disease? You know, I, I, I'm, 
in a part I agree with you because uh, in gastroenterology I think that this is this is a new field and maybe also there is a, a little bit of pressure also from pharmaceutical side that that this will be uh, some this is something that we have to cure and that many new drugs are uh, are entering in this field so i think that the idea is we have to prevent this because this will be the first cause of of of, of liver transplantation in in the future of course and at the moment if we are looking at our creation list for for liver transplantations uh, the patient with uh, with uh, with uh, with, uh, with uh, consequences of nash without uh, any other uh, damage to to liver uh, are are not existing so i agree in part you already noticed that, uh, that I am local patriot and I have to emphasize the uh, very important information that Croatia is the number one uh, uh, as a country uh, as a, uh, at the list of transportation, of the number of transportation per capita. So we have the highest number of uh, transportation, not just liver but also kidney transportation and other organs per capita. So we are proud for that. But we are proud uh, about soccer as well, but I have already <laughs> mentioned that. <laughs> and if I may, uh, I would kindly ask uh, Professor Pfeiffer and his team, unfortunately I didn't have chance yesterday, you mentioned uh, that high protein intake can, uh, can help in, um, in NASH, uh, so it can be helpful in uh, NASH after, transport, uh, after um, um, bariatric surgery. But is there any particular amino acid which you could identify as the most important or more important than others? Or just high intake, uh, the high uh, protein intake? Well, at present I think there, actually there is not so much evidence around that you really lower liver fat with high protein diets. We have some nice data. And in fact, the bariatric surgeons recommend high protein diets even without evidence to their patients because they want to get rid of too much liver fat because the liver, uh, it's difficult to operate with the non-invasive procedures if the liver is so big. So I think there should be more data. But there is very nice work by Schulman's group published in, um, in PNAS where they suggest a mechanism, and this is protein actually, and it's the amino group probably, in the urea cycle, activates one of those enzymes, ASS, um, which uh, is one of the synthases in that cycle, and it's it's AMPK. So AMPK would then kind of increase liver fat oxidation. The major pathway we see is a decrease in lipogenesis and, um, uh, uh, and uh, lipolysis, actually. And I think this is a very important pathway because lipolysis, Ulf has worked a lot about that and generated very nice data. The influx of fat into the liver determines how much fat it make so I think protein has these positive effects and, uh, uh, and there, there start to be mechanisms but I think much more work is needed about that and this is probably one of the positive effects among many of course of high protein diets but Andreas if I uh, may so uh, you were the first your group were the first one uh, who showed that high protein intake can be helpful in NASH as I'm aware of uh, in diabetes, there is yeah. Bar in diabetes. Barroso and so who showed the same in non-diabetics. Okay. May I ask you a question about high protein? Have you looked at the kidney function? Yes, we did. Actually, kidney f if you give vegetable protein, kidney function appears to improve because creatinine uh, contains methionine and this goes down. In fact, if you, if you take uh, um, different levels of and uh, it does not change. And if you, there are um, Cochrane reviews about kidney function and protein intake, uh, even though the nephrologists, based on animal experiments, state very strongly that it's bad. There is no evidence in humans, not even with progressive kidney disease. And this is Cochrane reviews meta-analysis. But the data are actually weak, and I think we well, I, I was thinking, that in fact, at the beginning of diabetic kidney disease, of glomerular hyperfiltration, because high protein intake will increase glomerular hyperfiltration, and this is not good for the future diabetic kidney disease. Because when glomerular hyperfiltration is present, then the deterioration of glomerular filtration is much more rapid. Well, this, it's a question of intraglomerular pressure and the regulation, as you know, as a hypertensiologist very well. 
the mechanism, if, if you eat a lot of protein, you have to eliminate more urea, and this increases kidney volume. There is no evidence that this does any harm to the kidney because it doesn't change the glomerular pressure. And, so, and while high, hyperglycemia also causes hyperperfusion of the kidney, as we can nicely see in our diabetic patients who have large kidneys, but this is a completely different mechanism. I'm, I'm not sure if you know about the glomerular pressure there. I don't, do not. Does hyperglycemia increase intraglomerular pressure? Uh, not directly, but it increases by tumor glomerular feedback. You know? so. Well, this can be the good guy in SGLT2 inhibitors, isn't it? Yeah, just, the just last quick, one, Professor uh, Thank you. But the last uh, question, uh, Ray uh, uh, from Finland. Um, we all, if you like, the diabetes community, look at Finland uh, with the great admiration with your successes with North Karelia, DPP, Jaco, Turmeleto, our member, Matthew Stupi, a wonderful job, wonderful results. Everybody in Finland eating Sicilian diet, I think, uh, or whatever. And then now you bring in computer to what I understand like DPP uh, concept. And probably next one will be artificial intelligence that everybody will have glasses, diabetic will think that they don't have diabetes. Uh, what is the secret of you guys in Finland? I think you have wonderful intervention, you have disciplined population, you have strict government or, or all about. What, what is how you succeed and we don't succeed in other countries? Can you tell us your secret? Except Char. Well, that's a good question, difficult question. <laughs> Perhaps we are just that good. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> that was a fair answer. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for all presentations and you for... Thank you very much.